The Ireland Club Football semi-finals were on at the weekend and it's going to be Curfin against Dr Croaks on St Patrick's Day for the All-Ireland title. But um, one of the stories really of the entire club season has been Guidor's progress to almost being able to pip that brilliant Curfin team in an All-Ireland, All-Ireland semi-final. Eamon McGee is on the line to uh, talk to us a bit about um, that journey that they've been on. Eamon, good morning to you. How are you doing? How are you? Yeah, we're um, you're back to normal life and reality this morning. How does that feel? Ah, uh, yeah, it's a, bit of a, it's a bit of a downer. A bit of a downer now when you when you don't have something like be it the Ulster Championship or the the All Ireland semi final to look forward to now. But that's just the, the way life goes. You know, we just have to get on with it and hopefully push on for it next year. You said you watched the game back yesterday. What what in particular struck you? Apart from the fact that obviously Carfin were really good. Yeah, well, you know, when coming off the field on on Saturday, we we thought we kind of we threw it away. We had we had the opportunity to win it, but what what struck me was that just the fact that Carfin just made us make the mistakes. We'd have prided ourselves on our decision making, making the right decisions at the right time, and the Carfin goals both came from from us giving the ball away, and we fouled them silly. But that's just Carfin just going at us and just putting us under pressure and. I just n- never realised even in the build up like we, we always knew like they're in the R and semi final, they're a brilliant team. But it's only when you sit back and look at them that uh, they were able just to press the button and and uh, up with a few gears. Yeah, I found it very interesting that you actually did sit down and watch the game yesterday so soon after it. Is that something you've always done and was it a difficult process? No, it, it's it's not something like I haven't watched, you'll be happy to hear this one, is that I haven't watched the twenty fourteen final properly. And then when Kerry beat us, so it's, it's not something I, I would like to do. But it's, I just needed to just get that closure on it because I've left it. And you know, the 2014 county, like with Donegal, still hurts. And maybe that's part of the reason is I haven't sat down and, and watched the whole game through, and reasons why we never we, we never pushed on. And I just wanted to just put it to bed and just just get on with the whole thing there. Yeah, um, in in terms of a team like Carfin, what surprised you about them on the field as opposed to the next day when you're watching or, or uh, I don't know, it's the day after, whatever, but tell me, like, when you were playing them, were they even better than you had assessed in the build-up when you were doing research on them? Yeah, because we, we did an awful lot of work on kickouts and an awful lot of work on, you know, shutting them down for the kickouts and they were able to just adapt to the pressure. They were able to adapt to whatever we threw at them. They were able to get the ball away. And, you know, the physicality stood out. It's just looking at them on the build-up, we thought, lovely footballers, but something that we weren't prepared for was the physicality and the fact that they were able just to turn us over so much and, you know, we we just weren't, weren't prepared for it. Is part of that just the experience they have of being here over the last number of years and kind of building slowly to this? I, th- I think that's a big part of it. They've been about this stage for a long time. Um, you know, once we got within two points, I would have liked to see us get level with them to see how they'd respond. But there, there's a part of me that just knows that they had another gear just to go at it and say, just pull away from us again. So, And that's all they do with experience. They've, they've been about that level for a long time. They've top quality players. And, you know, this is what we should be talking about, is talking about Cara Finland, just how bloody good they are. Tell me, when you talk about um, getting back to it again next year, like it's such a remarkable thing to come out of a county and then to come out of a province that like, it, may, it may never happen for this group of players again. It may never happen for your club that you reach this far again. Are you prepared for that? Or is that something that you kind of need to put in the back of your mind and just go, well, look, it doesn't really matter. The next training session is the one that starts our journey to try and get there and again next year. No, I'm, I'm definitely prepared for that. You know, we're kind of we're smart enough now to know we've been about long enough to know that, like the likes of myself and Neil and Kevin Cass and a few of the older boys might possibly never get to that stage again or never get an opportunity like that again. But it, it still means you just have to try, just have to knuckle down and just go at it again. And you know, hopefully there'll be another two or three players that come in. You know, underage, under underage structures and get over good. There's a good conveyor belt there, and hopefully, you know. They'll add to the team, and again, it's another year experience, so it might stand us. But you know, we have to be realistic too that there's a lot of good teams, not alone in Donegal, but in Ulster. And you know, the fact is, we we might not get there again. So, but it doesn't mean we won't we won't try. 
What was Saturday evening like, Emin? Yeah, because obviously there is the, the come down off a fairly disappointing defeat like that, but I presume there's also the appreciation for everything that had gone through the, the previous weeks, what you've been through, and also the sporting achievement of actually getting through to an All-Ireland semi-final. Well, you went to Brian Cox, didn't you? Yeah, I went to Brian Cox, now, so I was chatting about quasars and black holes, <laughs> and uh, you know, it wasn't until they, they rode down from, down from Dublin that they kind of sunk in, but you lost, uh, you lost an All-Ireland semi-final. Um, and that that disappointed. I think a few of the, few of the lads had a, a few beers, and you know it's probably not going to going to hit them till today. And the fact is, you lost an All Ireland semi final. You got to within two points of of Carfin. Uh, you put it up to Carfin, and it's it's just disappointing. And it won't be for another few weeks. It might be for a week. It might be for two weeks. That you know you appreciate what you've done, the journey we've been on, and you know the achievements. Because I've said this before that. We won in like one in a county title was my was my achievement and and that was a big achievement. The main thing was the main priority was just to steady the ship, wait for this crop of players to come through and possibly won a county county title. And now that we have the county title we have an Ulster and you know, you, you just you just want a chance, so that that'll that'll hit home in a few weeks, but possibly it's just a disappointment stage for the next few days. I mean I think the other thing that happened, um, that really transformed your club's journey was obviously the terrible tragedy that happened in January. There was a, a brilliant piece that Michael Foley did recently where he talked about your own relationship with Michal Rorty and mm -hmm. just the closeness that you had. We have this terrible thing in, in sport where whenever an accident happens we go, oh, look, it really puts sport and the, the fact that it's just a game in, into context. But that's actually bollocks. What, what it does is it proves that we really need sport to help us get through the terrible things that happen in real life and that without it, real life you know, wouldn't actually be in any way bearable. Um, how, do, how do you guys put context on everything that happened and how difficult was it to continue just playing, but also then how important was it that you did continue playing? I, I don't think it was difficult to continue playing. Like, it was, because that's what we do. We're, we're GA footballers, and that's a big part of our life. So if we didn't do that, you know, it would have been, it would have just added to the tragedy that, you know, what I did find from it was, you know, just the, the way we pulled together and the conversations we had, that, you know, upfront conversations we met on the, the Saturday after the funeral. Um, you know, you, you would have had honest conversations about how you felt and the, just the way the way we pulled together. And it was just a, a testament to the to the team and to the to the way, as you say, sport pulls it, pulls it, pulls you together. And, and what I did was just after the week was, well, like, why do we take it? something like that to happen for the, the GA club to pull together or for a sports club to pull together. Like, if we were operating on that level all the time, it would be so much better. We just need something terrible to happen for us just to, to go like that. But it's that's where we can be, and that's what a club can do all the time. But it just has to take something bad for it to happen, you know? Yeah. Do you mean, like, um, just talking openly about how you feel? Is it as simple as that? Like, is that the type of thing that could transform... A GAA club or any sports club or any or just relationships. Not, not, not have. even that. Like it's just the way that all the volunteers, you know, in some clubs you get, you know, infighting and people reluctant to take jobs. But when something like that happens, you know, people just roll in behind the whole club, and all the volunteers are out. Everybody's helping. You know, the Clonelly club who would have been uh, affected by the the accident too. They sent out a tweet on the Monday morning after it happened and says, "Listen, everybody's welcome." chat and a cup of tea and it was just something as simple as that there like and I think that a GA club should become not just about sports but a kind of social hub for the community and something like that should be available all the time and not in times of uh, dire need. Yeah so in a, in a way this has had a transformative impact and not because you reached an Ireland club semi-final but because you've come through that tragedy as a group. Yeah and, and you know hopefully it makes the group stronger um, you know, we've we've learned a lot about each other, and like we've, you know, when you when you see a club, a club mate of yours, when you see them struggling, when you see them them sad, and you reach out and you put the hand on the shoulder and you say it's going to be all right, that that brings brings you together, and it brings the friendship together, but it also brings the team together, and you know, it has it just has brought the club that that we were closer. Yeah, yeah. 
like you say that uh, you've obviously learned a lot about one another throughout this terrible time, but I presume there's al also a case of an individual basis there about you learning a bit more about yourself and going through this as a series of individuals. H has that been the case as well, Eamon? I'd say as, as I learned as an individual, yeah, definitely. Definitely. And, you know, um, I, I chatted uh, to Mick Foley about it, that w when things happen, we're at a stage now where, you know, I have, I have three kids and, you know, you chat about mortality and when you see a young man die and you see a friend die, um, you know, it, it hits home and you have these kind of, these thoughts, you know, what happens if something, if someone close to you passed away or how do you cope and, you know, on, on an individual level, it has affected me very much so. But, you know, it's, that's all part of it. Everybody goes through the the whole process of, you know, you know, we're, we're in a big boy world now. Um, and, you know, we just have to learn from it and move on with it. Yeah. I mean, we should talk briefly about the um, the fallout from David Brady's tweet as well. Um, obviously, Kevin Cassidy got back and that, that turned it into a, a very big story. Um, I'm going to read for people who are just listening to this. Um, they will, when the dust settles and time passes, in a quiet moment ask, did they pass up the opportunity of a lifetime? Was there anything they could have done extra? Posting multiple piss-ups won't win you in Ireland, and that's not winning. Well, not, that's not what winning is about. That was um, the tweet in the aftermath of the game. Around about 20 yeah. past eight on, on Saturday evening. Um, today, in, in your piece in The Star, you're, you're upset, really, about the fact that um, it, it wasn't the drinking after the games that cost you the game against Carfin, it was Carfin's greatness. Yeah, um, you know, as, as I learned on Brain Cox on Saturday, that the, the universe is finite, and we're talking about a David Brady tweet for two days here, going into day three. Um, there, there's just no need for it. Like, when Brady sits down and when he, when he thinks hard about it, he's going to realise that it wasn't the, there was no logic to his point at all. He doesn't know how hard we've trained. He doesn't know the preparation, the video work we put in. Um, you know, Kevin Cass would have been posting multiple videos the time we won the Ulster. He was possibly Edor's best player on Saturday. Didn't affect his performance. You know, I just don't see the the, the logic in this point here. Yeah, that's no, a fair point. The world is uh, is fine. Brian Cox seems to be pretty good. He was, he was probably enjoyed him. Uh, as I meant to get him the last time he was here, but uh, football interfered, so I definitely wasn't missing him, missing him this time. Yeah, you were happy enough to miss out in the uh, post-match celebration slash um, wake. That was, you knew in advance, though, that even if you won, you were going to go to Brian Cox. Ah, uh, yeah, no, it's safer, safer down Dublin in the O2 than to be up with, uh, be up with some of them, but... Listen, Eamon, we let you go. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Cheers, boys. Thanks. See you later. Simon McGee there, um, giving us some reflections on a fairly remarkable campaign for Guidor, uh, where ultimately they did go out against one of the great club sides. Yeah, it's been an, it's been an incredible. Just thought, like purely, obviously off the pitch, it's been like one of the most uh, incredible couple of months we've seen in GA circles and such uh, an example of how the GA community and the sporting community as a whole can come together uh, behind a, a greater cause. But then even separate to that, even if you just like watch the matches on their own and didn't know any of the context around that, it's also been a fairly remarkable season as well. I mean, when you look at the, the couple of underdog stories we've had, and I think even calling the, the Guido situation an underdog story is probably doing them a little bit of a disservice. No, I think, well. it, I think you, you, if you listen to what he says there, like they, they stuck it out because mm. they knew there was a good crop of youngsters coming, yeah. but like winning a county was what they wanted. Yeah. That, that makes them definitely underdogs like sure. at this stage of the tournament, I think. It's fair enough. Yeah, like taking out a, a fairly good Scotstown team as well, who a lot of people would fancy, who, who a lot of people were already talking about as uh, Ulster champions early on last year, was uh, was something amazing as well. And so, certainly, like I, I don't think they were quite on the level of the Mulniacta sort of level of, of underdog, but uh, certainly winning Donegal, as he said, was, was the big thing for them. And it was one hell of a story. I think they'll be back.